how do we train an elderly client? Now, to understand or get this answer to the question, we have to understand but what really defines someone as being an elderly client. An elderly client a lot of times refers to the age group of the individual. So that's obviously someone that's more advanced in their age, as well as then also a lot of times characterized by someone that has a reduced functionality. Now, generally we can see in the population of elderly clients that's obviously advanced in age, that this reduction of functionality, so they're no longer able to do activities of daily living all that well, and they most probably are dependent on someone else helping them out if they haven't been active, um, is all due to the body that's developing throughout our younger age and years up until the age of 30 and thereafter then reducing functionality thereof. So that's just almost like a natural process through which the body goes. Now, research has found that exercise and good diet can actually slow down this process of deterioration, which is great. And that's obviously one of our focus points that we um, obviously have when we train our day clients. So what physiology changes because we say there's a deterioration. So let's start with muscle because we're always interested in obviously moving and exercising and training muscle. That's our focus area. What changes within a muscle over age or over time? An elderly client generally has less muscle fibers, which means there's a reduction of type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers, as well as then there is also then an associated reduction in the force that can be produced by that muscle. Now, an interesting finding is that even though there's a reduction in muscle force that can be exerted, um, when they assess the cross-sectional diameter of a muscle, they actually realize that that cross-sectional area is not very much different to what it was earlier or before in younger years. Now, the reason for that is, is that there is an increase of fatty tissue that is deposited within the muscle, between the muscle fibers, and due to that, the cross-sectional area stays the same and but there is it's not made up of all that as much or the same amount of muscle fibers. Some of the muscle fibers also actually change into connective tissue which is also plastic and not elastic um, and that also further then affects posture and ability to produce force. So that explains then the first challenge that we have with training an elderly client is that they can't produce as much force. Secondly, there is also the neuro neuromuscular system that we're looking at which mean, refers to the neurological system. So the neurological system is also affected. The main effect of or deterioration of the neurological system is that there is a slowed rate of conducting an impulse to the muscle. So as we all understand, a muscle contracts in response to stimulus from, a neuro, from the neuron that innervates that particular muscle or muscle fiber. So now because the impulse is sent slower to the muscle, the muscle obviously contracts and movement is slowed and obviously the reaction time is also affected. And this is very important when reaction time is affected um, and coordination is also affected to a certain extent that there is also a greater risk for falling. Now, a big emphasis needs to be put into preventing clients from falling because they have found that there is also a direct or a significant correlation between you know, percentage of falls of an individual as well as their mortality rate. So, which means that their lifespan can deteriorate because of any injuries that can be occurred with, uh, uh, in the areas or regions, um, obviously such as the hip or you know, the femur, um, etc., due to that fall. And impact. So all of a sudden the functionality drops and there's just a continuous deterioration thereafter. It's not true in all cases but in most. So that's what we want to prevent is the rate of falling or prevention of falling of our clients. Now when we train our clients thinking about this muscles and we think about um, you know the neurons, neur neurological system is that we understand that we have to we can't let the client do plyometric exercise especially when the functionality has deteriorated to that level if we have an elderly client that has been training like the whole lives and they're like an SA athlete type of thing then yes more like faster type of movements can be implemented because they maintain the functionality but that general elderly client probably won't do a lot of explosive work because they it's 
a high risk activity, so high risk for injuries. So from there, we also have to consider to, and refer to the changes that occurs to the cardiovascular system. So it has been shown that there is reduction in the heart rate, as well as then the stroke volume, so the amount of blood that the heart shunts out with each contraction of the heart. And with that, then less blood is circulated to the muscles that needs to, add to, to, to obviously work and that are active. Now, what effect does that have on the clients in result of having to do a particular movement? Less oxygen, less nutrients are sent to the muscles, and we obviously need oxygen and nutrients for the muscle to maintain its functionality. So yes, that also further affects the functionality of the muscle and the ability of what they can do and what we can do with them. Further, there's also an effect of then a reduction in VO2 max. So we understand VO2 max is the maximum amount of oxygen that can be sent to or can be utilized by a muscle. So that also then affects the ability to do something over a long period of time. So cardiovascular training, that ability to continuously do it at a particular speed is then also affected. So once again, something to consider is that are affected, such as your physiological factors, such as maybe sights or hearing, which can also affect the way we, which we train our clients, such as if your client can't hear you or struggle to hear you, and we know how it is in gym, sometimes it's quite loud in a gym, we have to take them to a place where they don't feel all secluded because they want that psychological benefit of training as well and interacting with people because they might feel alone, you never know. So you kind of make them part of the training but find a space where they're able to hear you and obviously ensure that that communication pathway is also open and that you, they can communicate back to you as well. So those are all things that you have to consider and I do yet again encourage you to refer to your manual and read through all the other physiological changes that occur in the body as well. Now the great thing is when we train a client that they found that our clients respond similarly to as a young individual will respond to exercise. They're still human, which means even though they have a lack of strength or a lack of endurance or um, balance ability or muscular strength or endurance, all of that can improve just as a young individual can improve and respond to exercise stimulus. It just depends what you're doing with the client and what protocol you're following in order to get a particular type of improvement. So that's kind of, you know, that set principle, specific adaptation of imposed demand. So with that, we have to always refer to the guidelines given, or, given in our manual and obviously always carry on studying and because it's always new studies and finds better ways of, of prescribing exercise programs. But the guidelines given in your manual gives you a good background and basis to start and develop your program um, from and always considering your individual's age, your individual's um, physiological and medical history, um, their training history, all of that yet again individualizing the program and not just say oh you're an elderly client and therefore I'll train you as per any other elderly client. They're still an individual with their own training history um, and goals they want to achieve. So certain factors need to be pointed out that we're not focusing primarily on intensity. Um, rate of perceived exertion is great to use as a guideline for your cardiovascular intensity. Um, it's really focusing on more endurance type of repetitions with you, your clients. So focusing on muscular endurance. Um, and then obviously you can always carry on and then focus on and move on to more intense activities such as going from muscular endurance to muscular strength training um, where it's a little bit more demanding doing muscular strength versus muscular endurance. And they have found that you know, our big clients respond really well to high resistance training, but it depends on who you can do that with. That's probably more for the person that's been training with you for a while and moving on to muscular strength work, or the client that has been training before and they're now just carrying on and training with you. So yet again, always a progressive manner of training a client. First a lighter weight and then you can move on to a heavier weight. Um, or obviously according to specific sets and rep ranges that will ensure you you reach you know the best results possible and then obviously training such as neuromuscular training really important that's ability to get feedback from your peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system where is my foot positioned where am i where is my body in space so that's like spatial awareness um, awareness of where your body is and your body knowing like if you have to correct the positioning of your foot 
that feedback and interaction is really important. That's where the neurological training comes in. Examples of such training is a lot of balancing exercise, to be quite honest. That's a lot of feedback is given. So the stalk stand test, which is one of the tests that you do, that you can implement also as a type of exercise um, that will be, you know, a starting off point, or you can also progress from there, balancing on a bose ball with both feet. That's also a, sort of a form of proprioception as well. As well as then exercises such as isometric training is not um, prescribed for our big clients. As we all know that isometric exercise generally increases blood pressure and that is a general physiological characteristic of an elderly client that they tend to have high blood pressure of, of you know, well, side effects. We can't increase the blood pressure that generally already has a higher pressure within the vessel walls itself um, and can't respond to that due to lack of elasticity within the vessel walls. Um, and then there's obviously exercises such as stair climbing might be very good to do with an elderly client or gait training is very good to do with them as well because generally the elderly clients um, take smaller little steps and they're not as big and coordinated because they tend not to be as strong or balanced and they don't have the proprioception um, and with that it's also good to kind of do your gait assessment and even use similar type of activities to improve that gait which we always know is part of activity of daily living and that is one of our primary goals in training an elderly client. So with that, I would ask you to refer to your manual and go through all the details that they prescribe for what type of exercise you can do, what's the frequency of your resistance and cardiovascular training, and then attempt the, the activity that they have for the elderly clients in, on, obviously on, in your portfolio assignments. Um, and try and see how can you, you can always add a little bit to that client and say, you know, obviously just make it a little bit more real life for yourself. Um, and then also then interpreting the information that's given in this manual and then implementing that and say, well, I understand what a basic general, you know, unique characteristics of elderly clients and what I, what's the general guidance that needs to be followed for elderly clients and I will implement those particular exercises in taking consideration the unique characteristics of the elderly clients.